Welcome to Good Screenwriting, I'm Trevor Meyer, and today I'm going to talk about Screenwriting, a screenwriter's guide to mastering storycraft and writing a successful screenplay by Trevor Meyer. That's right, this is my book. Uh, it's on Amazon right now, it's available for 99 cents currently. Uh, I am doing a free promotion right now though. All you got to do is email me at trevor at trevormeyer.com. If you don't know how to spell it, just look at the bottom of the screen here. All right, Trevor at trevormeyer.com. So, uh, just shoot me an email, and I will send you a free copy. Okay. Uh, the only hang-up I've had so far is that it is currently not redeemable in Australia. You can still buy it in Australia, but I can't give a gift to anyone living in Australia right now. So. It's just a little glitch in my international marketing strategy, but you know what? Hopefully that'll change sometime in the near future. Uh, but what I would like to do now, actually, uh, since it's not really fair for me to review my own book, that wouldn't make much sense, uh, instead I'm just going to read a little bit from it. Um, there's no audiobook version of this. It's not in print yet. It's just an ebook. Uh, so I'm going to be reading a little bit from Chapter 3, because that's really when the ball gets rolling. I'm not sure exactly how much of it I'm going to read, but we'll just see what we have time for. All right. Chapter 3, The False Dichotomy, Developing Your Conflict, Plot, Subplots, and Characters. Which is more important, plot or character? Trick question. Plot and character are one and the same thing. The plot is not some overarching structure imposed upon your screenplay from the outside. It is the actions of your characters. That's all. Anytime your characters pursue their goals, which they should always be doing, that's plot. When you first come up with an idea for a story, you need to determine the core conflict. The core conflict is the engine that drives your story. It's the spine that everything else in your story is built around. And it exists between your protagonist and your antagonist. Before we go any further, I'd like to lay some ground rules here. One, your protagonist and your antagonist have to be two separate characters. No man versus self BS. Two different characters. Two, they have to be characters, as in played by actors who speak dialogue. The shark from Jaws is not an antagonist. It's a prop. The antagonist is the mayor who wants to keep the beach open, even though there's a shark out there eating people. Three, one of each. Only one protagonist and one antagonist. That last rule is probably the most controversial bit of advice that I have to offer, but I do it for a reason. Yes, you might have an ensemble cast of characters like in the Avengers, but one of those characters is going to get the most screen time. They'll be in more scenes or speak more lines of dialogue than any other character. That's your protagonist. If you disagree, a more neutral term might be main character. Whoever gets the most screen time in your story is your main character. As much as you want to balance out your cast, it's always going to tip in the direction of one character over all others. Feel free to deviate from these rules if you feel so inclined. If you feel comfortable having a character be his own antagonist, making the antagonist a force of nature, or having multiple protagonists, that's okay. You want to make these tools your own. But personally, I've found that sticking to those three basic guidelines makes it a lot easier to outline your story and to give it a solid, strong structure. So I'll proceed in accordance with those guidelines for the remainder of this book. Taking those three guidelines into account, your main conflict, the core of your story, comes down to your protagonist versus your antagonist. It's so simple, it's almost scary. There are only two possibilities. Here's the first scenario. Your protagonist wants to do something. Your antagonist wants to stop the protagonist from doing that thing. Here's the second scenario. Your antagonist wants to do something. Your protagonist wants to stop the antagonist from doing that thing. That's it. Those are your only two options. Really, both could be true at the same time, depending on how you look at it. What would be an example of the first scenario? How about Rocky? Rocky Balboa wants to last 15 rounds in the ring with Apollo Creed, and Apollo Creed wants to stop Rocky from lasting 15 rounds in the ring with him. That's it. That's the core conflict of Rocky. Or how about Back to the Future? Marty McFly wants to get his parents together in 1955, and Biff Tannen wants to stop Marty McFly from getting his parents together. 
In this case, Biff isn't actively trying to stop Marty from achieving his goal, but he does want to bully Marty's dad and date Marty's mother, which means stopping them from getting together. That makes him the antagonist. Most action movies, however, follow the second scenario, where the antagonist has a goal and the protagonist is the obstacle, like in Die Hard. Hans Gruber wants to steal bearer bonds and kill hostages. John McClane wants to stop Hans Gruber from stealing bearer bonds and killing hostages. In Die Hard, Hans is the one with the goal, an objective, and John's only purpose in the film is to get in the way, to muck things up for the antagonist. The same is true in every James Bond film, for example, Goldfinger. Goldfinger wants to destroy America's gold supply, and James Bond wants to stop Goldfinger from destroying America's gold supply. Why do I use the word stop? Because it creates instant conflict. There's no gray area, there's no way for both characters to win, no room for compromise. As long as one character wants to stop the other from achieving their goal, they will battle each other to the bitter end because there can be only one winner. Once you have the core conflict in place, you can begin building the main through line of your story. Everything related to that core conflict can be summarized, outlined, or written down on index cards. More on that in the next chapter. At a certain point, however, you may run out of story material. For example, let's go back to Rocky. Apollo Creed wants to stop Rocky Balboa from lasting 15 rounds in the ring with him. Okay, we can do something with that. The fight itself will take up most of Act 3. That's the final battle. We know that much. Before that, we can have some training. What's it like to train for a fight with a world heavyweight champion? Who trains Rocky? What's that guy like? What was Rocky doing before the big fight? He was a local boxer fighting for cash to pay his rent. Then you can flesh out Apollo's side of the conflict. How did Rocky get the opportunity to fight the champ? How did Apollo come up with that idea? How does Apollo train for the fight? Maybe we can have a tortoise-in-the-hare type fable where Apollo is so overconfident that he metaphorically takes a nap, allowing Rocky to overtake him in the end. All of that stuff will get us most of the way there. But when it's all said and done, we've got about 70 pages of possible material, which will give us a runtime of about 1 hour and 10 minutes. That's no good. What can we do to flesh it out to a healthy 120 pages without adding meaningless fluff or filler? That's where subplots come in. There are lots of different definitions of subplots, but for the purposes of this book, I'll describe a subplot as any relationship other than protagonist-antagonist. In other words, the relationship between Rocky and Apollo is the main plot. Any other relationship is a subplot. Rocky and his manager, Mickey, have a relationship, which is its own subplot. Rocky feels like Mickey never believed in him before, but now that Rocky's got this great big opportunity to fight the heavyweight champ, all of a sudden Mickey wants to help. Where was he when Rocky was a nobody? That's great stuff. But the main subplot of Rocky, the thing that makes it really special and elevates it above and beyond your average sports movie, is the relationship between Rocky and Adrian. The love story fills most of the 50-minute empty space not occupied by the main through line of the film. If you want to add length to your script without adding any fluff or filler, either add more characters to it, or explore more of your character web. Explore every character's relationship with each other major character in the film, and watch your scenes multiply. Conversely, if your script is too long, you can remedy that by keeping your characters grouped together rather than split apart. In The Avengers, there's one scene near the midpoint of the film where the filmmakers were able to cover about five or six different subplots in just as many minutes, because all of the characters were grouped together in the same room. That allowed them to dive into the conflict between Tony and Steve, Bruce's suicide attempt, Nick Fury's deception, and how Thor's visit to New Mexico changed the way S.H.I.E.L.D. operates, all in the course of one fluid conversation among all of the principal characters in the film. If the script had been too short, Writer-director Joss Whedon could have paired the characters off and had those scenes occur separately. There are advantages to both styles. Breaking the characters off into small groups makes things more intimate and can deepen some of the relationships in the character web. But the advantage of stacking all of those scenes into one was that it saved time, allowing the rest of the film to move at the correct pace. As you build these subplots and explore your character web, each of your characters has an opportunity to become more complex and dynamic if you know the right way to approach it. 
I've heard lots of theories on how to create three-dimensional characters. Some make more sense than others, but I'll tell you what I found works best. Unless you're writing a short film, odds are your screenplay will consist of more than one character. Even Buried, the Ryan Reynolds film that takes place entirely in a coffin, has a cast of at least 21 speaking characters who converse via cell phone. I believe that focusing on the cast of characters as a whole is the secret to developing each individual character. Their differences will play off of each other in ways that highlight each character's unique qualities. For example, let's take another look at the cast of the Avengers. Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, Bruce Banner, Thor, Natasha Romanoff, Clint Barton, Loki. There are other important characters in the film, but for now let's focus on the top seven. We could do a Venn diagram and explore their similarities and differences, but really similarities are boring. It's the differences that create conflict. So let's forget about common ground. How are these characters different from one another? Tony Stark, irresponsible. Steve Rogers, responsible. Tony Stark, breaks the rules. Steve Rogers, follows the rules. Tony Stark, cool. Steve Rogers, square. Tony Stark, selfish. Steve Rogers, selfless. Tony Stark, human. Steve Rogers, superhuman. We could go on and on, but I've found that five traits for each character are enough data points to understand the differences between the two. With that list, we've now created a strong contrast between Tony Stark and Steve Rogers, which leads to lots of juicy conflict, ultimately culminating in Captain America's Civil War. So how does this lead to multifaceted characters? After all, if you read Tony Stark's qualities, he seems like a pretty flat cliché. Same goes for Steve Rogers. They certainly seem to be one-dimensional, but take a look at this. Tony Stark, in a loving relationship. Bruce Banner, alone. Tony Stark, confident. Bruce Banner, awkward. Tony Stark, open to the world. Bruce Banner, hidden from the world. Tony Stark, embraces his power. Bruce Banner, hides from his power. Tony Stark, believes in Bruce. Bruce Banner, doesn't believe in himself. In this relationship, we see a totally different side to Tony Stark. Compared to Steve Rogers, Tony is irresponsible, he breaks the rules, he's cool, he's selfish, and he's human. But compared to Bruce Banner, Tony is in a loving relationship, he's confident, he's open to the world, he embraces his power, and he believes in Bruce. Can you see how we get to see Tony Stark be two different people depending on which of these two supporting characters he interacts with? Now, I'm not saying that you have to pair off every single one of your characters and create one of these tables for each combination, but if you're struggling with adding new layers to your characters, making them unique, and amplifying the conflicts between them, then go ahead and make one of these tables. It's an extremely useful tool. All right, so that's it for my little sample excerpt from my book. If you enjoyed that, you can get a free copy from me by emailing me at trevor at trevormeyer.com or you can purchase it at amazon.com. I'll put some links in the description below. Um, again, free copies currently not available in Australia. I'm sorry to say, not my fault. That's some legal loophole they have in Australia. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but I can't give away free copies to people in Australia. I'm not sure about the UK. Uh, there might be a problem with that too, but give it a shot. I'll try to give you a free copy, and if it doesn't work, I apologize. Hopefully it'll change sometime in the near future. But for now, let me know what you think about this excerpt in the comment section below. This is Good Screenwriting, and I'm Trevor Meyer. See you next time.